Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about a tweet I sent out uh, way back when, so April 10th here of 2022. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of finance is reactive to risk and is not proactively managing and monitoring it. Data science and machine learning will be the next to blame for a market crash. And I threw that out there. I think a lot of people just inherently understand that or they have like this inkling of like, it makes sense. But somebody asked here, so Sentinel Sale asked, elaborate please with a smiley face. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to go about this without actual data, but we're gonna do a little bit of drawings here on my screen maybe uh, to kind of drive this home a little bit. So one of the biggest issues we have in modeling in general, it doesn't matter if you're coming from tech or finance or somewhere else here, uh, the biggest issue we see is that everybody overfits. And for some reason, I get this really odd, um, I guess, understanding or commentary from people that, you know, like machine learning overfits. And it's like, I, I get it. I understand that. Let's, let's move on here. But, you know, looking back, statistics can also overfit. Like statistics is really the parent. It's the big shell of stats modeling, uh, theoretical understanding of how we do these sorts of things. And stats is really just nestled inside of part of mathematics. And you have probability and statistics and a whole bunch of other, you know, mathematical fields uh, that all tie together in this. And when I started my career back in 2014, we had CCAR. And CCAR, so for those of you that don't know, is uh, Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review. Banks are required to do it. After the 2007-2008 financial crisis, um, not shockingly, banks weren't managing their risks. There's a lot of what's called silo risk management. So essentially, like, you know, the credit risk management team only manages credit risk in one silo. That's all they look at. And then the market risk team would only manage market risk and operational risk would only be done in operational. And then you have regulatory risk, which are kind of the big four categories, as I call them. Uh, other firms as well. So trading firms. So this isn't just banking specific. Uh, a lot of times they would look at very specific portfolios. So if you had like six portfolio managers, for example, uh, they would look and manage risk for a portfolio manager. And so when you have six portfolio managers, uh, who's looking at this from a high perspective to say, hey, we're all taking the exact same position here, right? We're all shorting this company or we're all long this other company, or we have some sort of strategy developed and we're all basically doing the same thing, right? You have to look at this from a holistic firm wide view, which was the whole uh, drive behind Dodd-Frank, which was, again, just not put into place very well. There's a lot of good intentions in it. I think there's a lot of great positives that came out of that regulation, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of nonsensical, uh, I don't know what, what I want to call, uh, repetition that we end up having to do and we go through just because it's CCAR. But then at the same time, right, with this tweet, what I'm trying to point out here is even after the 2007-2008 financial crisis, um, banks don't get it. Hedge funds don't get it. People in finance don't get it. They're not looking at risk as a long-term perspective of risk management. And even when I have tweets on YouTube, you know, people tweet on there, oh, it's just risk management. As if like somehow risk management is different from hedge funds and is different from banking and is different from, you know, even like an average retail person. Even technology, like I'm going through tech stacks here with people and talking about, you know, different technology problems. And technology has all kinds of like unit testing and root testing. Like they're doing essentially in a way risk management for software development and design. Now, again, financial risk management is far more complicated in the sense that you have drivers that are unpredictable and the economy in itself is this massive behemoth and it's impactful in all these political decisions that are made for, you know, by different countries and people and all these things, you know, aggregate down into a lot of different risks. For example, like inflation, which we are facing now. So on a modeling perspective though, in 2007, 2008, the big hype was quants and copula modeling. Um, I remember my stats teacher in grad school was talking about, you know, there was a student who worked on Wall Street he got fired after the big crash and he came here to Michigan and we were teaching Copula models, which was after 2008. And so they were like complaining, like, this is horrible. This is where we lost all this money and going on and on and on about it. But the reality was uh, the majority of people that were actually building Copula models didn't understand the assumptions behind the models. They were too unrealistic. And often they picked things, for example, like really simple distributions, because when you do a cross of two distributions, it's easier to use a normal distribution than it is to use something like a non-parametric which would be a lot more realistic here. Um, but I'm not gonna go into the technicalities behind that. And so when that thing blew up, the quants were these absolute horrible people. They ruined Wall Street. There's books on it. 
Uh, there's complaints in all the news articles, the financial future, quants are horrible people, they ruined Wall Street. Um, and that was the kind of the message that went out with a lot of it. A lot of the managers that ran all these firms essentially put their hands up and took no responsibility, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, but they used these models and they also didn't understand how they were actually working. So that's kind of setting the scene for 2007, 2008. Uh, you can do that same scene with like the tech bubble uh, and other financial crises back through time. There's always somebody that gets blamed for it. And of course, you know, when bad things happen, it's not always one group of people or one person typically. Uh, you typically have a group of people that run firms and institutions and, you know, are making a bunch of different decisions and there's political decisionings. So governments, of course, always meddling as well. And so you add all these things together and it ends up being essentially that people just act irresponsible because they're chasing dollars and aren't managing their risks. So the Dodd-Frank Act of 2007, 2008, to address that, which came out, I believe, in 2010, uh, that was supposed to address a lot of this by getting rid of these risk siloings. So we're going to look at risk as a holistic perspective here. And then, of course, part of Dodd-Frank was SR 11.7, which is a regulatory letter on how we validate models. Now, model validation is just making sure the models work as they are intended to work. But also validation's responsibility is to be kind of that second line of defense where we step in and say, hey, this makes completely no sense here. Like, why are we doing this? Um, so this actually happens a lot now in banks, and I'm going to explain a little bit why this is so risky. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a credit example here. I don't know how exactly to do this, but I'll walk you guys through it. So credit models, what we're trying to predict is expected losses on um, credit products. So think about like credit cards, uh, mortgages, auto loans, personal loans, um, rarely ever student debt. Um, but you have all this different types of credit products baked in here, and you have to make loans and do expected losses, which seems like a fairly easy, straightforward thing. But it ends up getting a little more complicated because you have to break out expected loss into actually three components, which is going to be PD, probability of default, uh, LGD, loss given default, and exposure at default. This is just the typical framework you use. Now, you can deviate outside of that if you want and do other you know, methods, but you have to come up again with reason and rationality on why you're doing it. And when a lot of these models get submitted to my desk, being a validator over the years, they often overfit regardless if they are statistical or machine learning. And so now one of the scapegoats I continually see is people say, oh, it's a, it's a stats model. Like, don't worry about it. It's not going to overfit. And yet they're overfit. And so, uh, why this is important now on a industry perspective, on a loss perspective here is imagine you made a loan on a mortgage and you issued a ton of mortgages. And let's say, I don't know, they're 10 year, 20 year and 30 year mortgages here. Uh, right. If Once I lock that rate in, once I make that loan to that customer, I can't go back to that customer and say, hey, by the way, uh, the market's going to flip or the market's crashing right now and everyone's defaulting on these loans. I need my money back. Right. Once you make that loan, once you lend money out to someone, you can't get it back. And a lot of these products have fixed rates. They're not variable rates. So you have a lot of risk in the sense that, you know, rates are going to be moving. Now, of course, it is quite ignorant to think it's just rates. You have to also have to look at things like inflation. You also have to look at things like GDP, uh, HPI, so house pricing index, for example, um, unemployment rates as well. All these things are baking into the economy. It gives the you a nice macro view of how things are humming along. But then you have to start drilling down into the fact of what type of loans do you make? Are you super primes, so like the best of the best? Are you prime, near prime, subprime, or deep subprime? All of these categories react and behave differently in different scenarios and different financial you know, stresses or good times. So these all kind of bake into that as well. So you think about this as like a macroeconomic problem. And then we have to start drilling down into the like subcategories. And then eventually we're going to get into the microeconomic factors, which is how we actually model is at the micro level here. Uh, most firms do not put in macro effects unless it's a CCAR model. So now we have segmented models where you have a, uh, a model that's only for the macro level and you have a model that's only for the micro level. And unfortunately, as the big failure with most um, fake economics nowadays, they can't figure out how to actually make the two agree, which makes no sense. Because if you add up all these small people, these all these micros, right, all these little individuals, that results in the final output of the economy. So you can think about unemployment, GDP, things like that. Uh, you know, let's just do unemployment here. Uh, if I look at my portfolio and I model these out based on the unemployment of each individual here, um, the unemployment as a whole country 
It's just going to be a bigger perspective of a larger portfolio, essentially. Now, what ends up happening with the modeling is everyone gets really excited and they model everybody today and they overfit it. And give you an example on this. The industry likes to keep logistic regression models with 30 or less variables. That's just kind of the metric we use here. But I see a lot of people that don't look at things like the VIF, so variance inflation factor, which looks for multicollinearity between variables. Uh, I also don't see people using the walled chi-square value to help drop variables that really aren't adding that much value. And oddly enough, with logistic regression, I often see people just like fudging in more and more and more variables. And you have a model of 40, 50 variables. And now it's like most of these variables have, you know, no value. Now, going back to that tweet here, right, we're not really managing risk here. All we're caring about is we're just predicting expected loss for profitability sake. But the issue is, is when this blows up or when we start to see it blowing up, it's too late in a loan, right? I've made a 10-year loan. I mean, what, what do you do at this point? You're going to have to do some sort of external factor, like buy other products to help hedge those risks or what banks do as well. Uh, you can securitize a lot of these loans into products and then offload them onto other banks. Now, again, this is if you are managing your risk and if you see it coming. The issue being is that traditionally in finance, we look at this over and over and over again, people don't start panicking until the market's crashing. Once we're free falling through the floor, then everybody goes, oh crap, I'm in a bad position. I need to offload all this information, all these uh, bad products now or all these different you know products that we have. And so they try to offload as many as they can uh, the issue being is who's going to buy them once you're free falling. No one's going to do it. So it puts you in a bind. It puts you in a tight spot. Again, this is the models themselves and the risk management practices all tied into one. It's an individual personality people issue. They don't understand risk management. Uh, it is also a model development and model validation issue because the models themselves that are being built uh, aren't very reactive to market shifts and market moves, especially on the credit side. Um, also for time series modeling as well for things like CCAR, most people don't take them serious. And I think this is why. So give you a perspective here on CCAR modeling from the inside. Uh, you get a bunch of data. You try to get as much data as possible because you're typically working with monthly data. You model it out. You create a forecast. If that forecast says we're going to have a crisis in that period somewhere and it's going to be really bad and you have to model out three scenarios. So you have a uh, base adverse and severely adverse. And of course, we all use Moody's data for the most part because the Federal Reserve has oddly mandated people do that. And I get why they did it. Uh, banks were wanting to do forecasting internally, and this would add more fuel to the fire with the issue I'm going to point out. And that issue is, is as soon as you create a forecast, even if that's a really good model and even if it makes a lot of sense, uh, the issue with it is that people specifically management, they don't want those on the books because if the results from your models come out to be absolutely dismal and there's like a really bad scenario coming into play here, then what ends up happening is the bank has to hold more capital on its books, which it can't use to lend out to make more loans, to make more profit. So they say, you know, development team, go back and build me a model with a better forecast here. So the CCAR piece is incentivized essentially to come up with good forecasts. Again, if you let banks do their internal forecasting themselves, of course, they would make nice and rosy forecasts. And to top all of this off, I see absolutely horrible model development, model validation practices, um, ranging from things, for example, such as people going back and changing their data. So the development data. Yeah, they will drop things or they will change time windows and rerun things, trying to get a better, what they call holdout or out of time here in time series. This is a huge no-no. Like this violates everything under the sun for statistics and data science. Uh, you're basically just fitting a line to fit a line. You have absolutely no care what ends up happening or how well the model actually works in practice here. That happens a lot. Again, there's a lot of just, I think, uneducated people building models that don't realize that you need to check different tests and you know attributes and do stress testing inside these models themselves to see where they're actually going to fail and then monitoring those and then again trying to do a longer forecast here on how this is going to impact you and this leads me to the final point here with data science as well which is you need to understand your model and this is why data science and machine learning will take the fall when these crises start to kind of unfold if it's not this crisis it'll definitely be the next one uh a lot of people view data science, machine learning, and AI as a black box. And then they keep saying, it doesn't matter, Dimitri, that it failed, right? It doesn't matter that we don't understand what's going on on the inside. None of this really matters. All we really care about is that we're getting a really good fit. And then as soon as the model starts to fail, we'll monitor it, right? We'll look at it. 
we'll do ongoing performance monitoring, as they say, in the banking side. Uh, in the tech side, I keep saying like, you know, they go, oh, we've got software. We purchased the software and it monitors our model and does all this stuff. That's fine. But once, <laughs> once that model is already failing to a very specific point, and most OPM, so ongoing performance monitoring metrics that people are using, uh, the thresholds they're using are too wide. So the model's already starting to fail and it's not gonna get caught until it's too late. And by that time, even if you could do an automated model fit with machine learning, it's too late, especially in credit products, right? You're already in a bad position. You can't unload these. You already made the loans. Uh, you're in a bad spot here. So you need to really think these things through. And again, machine learning and data science, I think will be the one that takes a lot of the fall on this, this crisis or the next one uh, in the sense that, you know, the models will fail. The statistical issues I see, the lack of testing on statistics is really shocking and should be like a really serious consideration that executives should be taking into con like consideration here, right? But they don't. They don't think it's that big of an issue and they're spending money on all kinds of other things. Like we see like, you know, diversity and inclusion, nonsensical things and training programs and this, that and the other and promotions. And yet I'm looking at it like, well, how come we're not, you know, focusing on improving the current employees we have and fixing the issues we really do have. Anyways, that's a whole other rant here. But, you know, this is where we're going to see the, the blame game going, though, because everybody's so reliant and everyone's OK with having a black box. And now the banks are doing explainable AI. And it's really just sadly some metrics like Lime, for example, added around it. There's some hand waving and there's just not a lot of, you know, conceptual risk management practice looking out to the future, looking at how these models are going to fail. And most importantly here as my final point, actually testing machine learning models. I know this blows people's minds for some reason. Yes, machine learning has all the same issues that statistics has. Um, I saw somebody online, I shockingly just wanted to cry when I read this. Uh, but they mentioned, you know, like, what's the difference between statistics and machine learning? And somebody said, you know, statistics, we care a lot about, uh, you know, how things are done, why they're done, basically understanding the model itself and why we're using it and drawing that, you know, relationship and that understanding here. And on the other side, you know, data science, and machine learning, they kind of stated, you know, we just don't care about p-values. We don't care about testing. We don't care about importance. This isn't really that important. We just need a really good fit. And that's really all that matters. So really, if you're for data science, you're on that side. And if you really just want to care about all this, you know, technical jargon and testing, then you're on the stat side. This is a horrible way to look at things, um, but this is going to be how the crisis falls and why the blame will fall on data science and machine learning, because we will see so much of this like overtly ridiculousness of people making statements like that. And finally, uh, as my final statement, uh, I think stats and machine learning are the exact same thing. All of my team build both. There's no difference between them. Uh, we're building models. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.